Seeing that Halloween is quickly approaching, I thought it might be appropriate to open the 2022 conference with a bit of a ghost story, a bit of a mystery, a bit of a riddle, a story that reaches out from beyond the grave. It is called A Kept Secret. If you are into Flat Earth long enough, you start to realize that a lot of your time is spent answering questions from the general public. And being that I have been doing this for going on eight years, I also have received more than my share of the usual suspect questions. They go something like this. Mark, what about meteors? Mark, how do eclipses work? Mark, why do you carry 99 cents in your pocket? Well, because that way I always have exact change. One of my favorites is, Mark, how can something as big as Flat Earth be kept a secret? It's a good question. To reinforce the point, I look to the wisdom of this man. Ben Franklin said that three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. I somewhat disagree with this statement. Given the right motivation, secrets can be kept at any level, and for the first time, I'm going to share one of mine with you. In 2015, several months after the clues were made, my family let me know that an interesting handwritten letter had been discovered. This very letter up on the screen right now. It's probably been a while since you have read anything in longhand, so I have transcribed the contents. The letter goes exactly like this. You may have missed it on the envelope, but in the corner of the letter, you can see it was sent from the city of Chelan, Washington, November 1st, 1935. It was sent to R.S. Purvis, El Rey Apartments, Seattle, Washington. Dear R.S.P., I say, what ho, pip pip, cheerio, and all that sort of thing. Did you get my letter on the 15th as well as the one on the 27th instead? You didn't? Well, I admit I must have forgotten to send them, but if I had written them, I would ask the following questions. How is ye old schoolwork? Ditto for the job. Is anyone in my private seat as yet? With these fundamental points out of the road, we can proceed with the letter. Life, east of the mountains, has changed swiftly in the past few days. I hope it hasn't affected you in the same manner. We are in the icy grip of a cold wave, the likes of which we have never seen before. Work is at a standstill in the orchards and packing houses because fruit cannot be touched while frozen. The loss has been estimated at from one to three million dollars. Worse luck for the growers, many of whom have more debts already than the Democratic Party. This morning it was 10 above zero here and colder elsewhere. I have a slight cold myself to keep in step with the times. Enough for the weather, as you read it in the paper anyway, or do you? Same thing. I went to work as soon as I came back here and have been at it ever since. Most of my Sundays I have spent going hunting with my gal, which accounts for the fact that I have written no letters or even had a pen in my frozen mud hook since leaving, leaving Seattle. Great success has been ours in the field, if one forgets that we were went hunting for deer without results for we have bagged three Chinese pheasants, three valley quail, and two huns. Oh yes, and a rabbit. Lots of fun was had by all. To get back to Wilson's, I will await your reply, informing me just how you are getting along, and anything else of interest about the old stomping grounds. I am not just sure yet when I'll get back, but if the rest of the apple harvest is a flop, I'll be back in the middle of November, I imagine. How does the situation look around there for getting a janitor's job when I get back? Are they crowded with janitors or have some of them dropped out? Advise me as to the situation, will you? Well, Spence, I can't think of anything else right now, so I'll close this and move up closer to the stove. Brr, ten above. Write soon if you're not froze up. Sincerely, George Sargent. Some of the junior detectives out there may have already found a plot hole in this story. The letter was written by my grandfather, George Sargent. Was the letter not sent? How did I acquire it? Did we track down R.S. Purvis and after enhanced interrogation force him to give up the letter? Not exactly, but we will get to that in a bit. R.S.P. stands for Robert Spence Purvis. He dropped his first name and went by Spence, so for the rest of this I will call him Spence. If you listened carefully, you may have also detected an odd pacing in the letter. 
I saw this as well and suspected that it was written in code. To that point, I sent copies of the letter to several cryptographers. They both concluded that it was probably using a simple book cipher. Simple in that it could be decoded if you had a copy of the book, which both men used, a book which was never found. While the code was interesting, I was more concerned in what happened after this letter was sent. In 1935, both of these men were in their teens. Some years later, they would get wives and move to Seattle to raise families. This is a current map of the greater metro Seattle area. George Sargent lived on 85th Street, while Spence Purvis moved to Magnolia. I know the Seattle area well and can tell you that back then the drive time between those two locations was around 15 minutes. As you can see from this 2022 Google map, the 15 minute drive is still possible today. And yet, even though they both lived in the same city, this letter was the only proof that these two men knew each other at all. After 1935, there were no private dinners which involved them, no public gatherings, no known phone calls, and no other correspondence. All this changed in 1961 when suddenly, for some unknown reason, the two men strongly encouraged their firstborn children to drop their current relationships and start dating each other. These two children were Patty Purvis and Ken Sargent, seen here in this 1961 photo. In 1963, after further encouragement by the two families, Patty and Ken were married. On a strange side note, their wedding rehearsal dinner was held on November 22nd, 1963, the day JFK was killed. Now, some might take this as a strong sign or hint, but not these two. No, they moved forward. And so, in 1968 and 1969, Patty and Ken had what appeared to be two alien children. So adorable. Over the next few years, their eyes became less black, and they were introduced into the general population. The hope is that they would fit in and be able to live among you. The boy then grew up quietly on an island near Seattle. Notice the large head compared to his body, a sign that he was probably destined to become a supervillain. He applied to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and this was the actual photo submitted in hopes of gaining favor with House Slytherin. His application was denied because of psychological concerns. A setback to be sure. Undeterred, he attempted to make alliances with other groups outside of normal channels. During that time, he mastered in game theory, subliminal hot sex techniques, and world domination concepts. The groups he was involved with did not allow photography. This shot, taken in 1996, is actually with my aunt and uncle who were visiting from out of town. And in 2015, he went on to become the freshman recruiter for the most influential grassroots movements in the history of our civilization, that being Flat Earth 2.0. And now the mystery unfolds. Yes, George Sargent and Pen Spence Purvis were both my grandfathers. They knew each other when they were kids, and for some reason, this was a secret they were willing to take to the grave. George Sargent died in 1999. Spence Purvis died in 2018. However, our family found the letter in 2015. It was sitting in a box of old correspondence belonging to Spence Purvis. We asked him about it. At the time, the 97-year-old stated simply that yes, he did know George Sargent, and then said nothing more on the subject until his death a few years later. Most families tend to cherish and share interesting stories like this, and one would think that this topic would have come out sooner or later, but it didn't, even after the two children were married or when their two grandchildren were born. Even after the numerous alcohol-fueled holiday gatherings, it never came up in conversation. Now, I can see the wheels turning in your heads. Some of you think you have the simple answer to this secret. Mark's grandfathers had to be gay. This is an image from Brokeback Mountain, the 2005 movie starring Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal, which told the story of two gay men in 1963 and how they tried and failed to keep it from their families. Were my grandfathers gay? Sure, it's possible. I'll give you that. Many gay couples try to keep their secrets every day. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. Even in the celebrity world. Let's take a look at a few quick examples. Actors Cary Grant and Randolph Scott lived together for years. This, by the way, is the same Randolph Scott that was mentioned in the classic movie Blazing Saddles. 
Hollywood does what it can to keep this secret even today, half a century later. Rock Hudson and James Dean. This is an outtake shot from the movie Giant. If Rock Hudson hadn't died of AIDS in 1985, this still might be kept a well kept secret. Apologies to the James Dean fans out there. He will always be a 50s icon, and I loved his work, even though he became famous after only making three movies and dying at the age of 24. Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. Catherine, widely considered the greatest actress of all time, actually wanted to marry Cary Grant for appearances sake, but had to settle for Spencer, who also needed to marry for appearances sake. David Weiss and Zulu One. I cannot confirm the authenticity of this photo. All I can tell you is that I was there and uh, a lot of flowery drinks were involved. If my grandfathers were indeed gay, does that help fill in the plot? Not really. Some factors to consider. First, neither of them were exactly lookers, and both men married women more attractive than them. Second, gay men are not known for long-term relationships, and if George and Spence were a couple and were insanely patient enough to wait until their children got married decades later, then why not spend a lot more time together after their firstborn children were engaged in 1962? And given that they lived only 15 minutes apart, why wasn't even a casual friendship ever mentioned? In addition, these two men were polar opposites in a number of ways. George Sargent was born into some money, but went into sales and lived most of his life in the lower middle class. Spence Purvis was raised dirt poor, but became a career accountant for a large firm and died wealthy. George was born and lived for the outdoors. He hunted, fished, and so did his wife. Spence was a desk jockey, collected stamps, and read periodicals about accounting. The only thing they had in common was that they were both Masons, and even then they were from different sides of the tracks. George was a demole in high school, joined the Order of the Templars, and eventually received the ceremonial sword. Spence joined the Scottish Rite and became a 32nd degree in 1955. Is it possible that these young two Masons found an obscure bloodline and were part of a larger ritual? Could they have then gotten their two firstborn children to marry, and the firstborn child of that union then possibly became a secret prophecy child? Eh, I'm not exactly buying it. I mean, if I was this child, wouldn't I have shown some special abilities by now? Yeah, I'm sure I've done some strange and cool things over the years, but I've never deliberately manifested anything. I say, let us put that to the test right now. I, Mark Kendall Sargent, request... No, no, that's wrong. That's not strong enough. I command that a multi-faction group of UFOs start hovering over this facility. Come on, guys. Don't make me look bad in front of the Earth people. Don't leave me hanging. Ah, it was worth a shot. Had I pulled this off, some of the smokers from outside the lobby would have run in here yelling and screaming incoherently. Then your phones would have started ringing, the electrical system might have gone haywire, but that's fine. As the old saying goes, don't regret what you have done, regret what you haven't done. To conclude this little journey, let's take a quick look at a few secrets that hide in plain sight. If you are going to take anything from what I say today, other than Mark is a genuinely strange guy, remember that things are rarely what they first appear to be. The U.S. President, Thomas Jefferson, owned a large plantation with slaves. And some of you right now are thinking he's on the $2 bill because he was the second president. Up until this year, I thought that as well. He's not. Is it part of the Mandela effect? I'm looking at you, Brian Staveley. The second president was actually John Adams. Jefferson was, or is now, the third president. Either way, Thomas Jefferson won't be pulled off of Mount Rushmore anytime soon, no matter how many protests there are. Neither will George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, or Teddy Roosevelt, and for the record, cancel culture sucks. John Wayne smoked a lot of marijuana, but Hollywood will still to this day always show you the straight-laced, tougher-than-nails Western lawmen. Knight Rider was initially developed as a Saturday morning kids show, but the parents of the children in the focus groups liked it so much it became a primetime hit, even though the premise was, of course, ridiculous. 
My grandfathers had a secret that they took with them to the grave and left almost no traces of their conspiracy. And Flat Earth was kept a secret for hundreds of years, long before world governments and NASA, only to be rediscovered by intelligent and awake people like you. I would like to wrap this up with lyrics from a song that has inspired and haunted me since my childhood. It speaks of a future that was denied to us, a future we should have had, with cities in the sky, flying cars, and robot servants. It goes exactly like this. Meet George Jetson, his boy Elroy, daughter Judy, Jane, his wife. And that's it. Not only does the entire thing read like they died in a car crash, but the entire Jetson song has only 11 words. Meanwhile, the Flintstone song, made by the very same company, had 11 words in just the first verse. 11-11. The end. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Long live Flat Earth. And of course, hot sex.